got a really interesting session today um, with our three speakers. So I won't go through all the bios, it is in your app. But Cesar, with, who is Director of Research at Sura Asset Management, has wide international experience. Uh, he holds a Bachelor of Science and also a Master's Degree in Finance. And he's a frequent le lecturer in international and corporate finance for graduate programs. We have Richard King Irvin Funds Management, who's the CEO. He's held management positions in financial services and business for over 30 years. And an interesting fact is that he's also a commercial pilot, which is a, I'm not sure how he ended up here. And we have Greg, uh, who's the Deputy Chief Investment Officer at Host Plus. Um, once again, Greg has wide experience both as the Deputy CIO at Host and his time at JANA. Another interesting fact is his actual degree, he has a PhD in physics. So wide experience, not just in emerging markets here. Um, we want it to be an interactive session. So um, please share your views and opinions throughout the session in the Q&A app. I think you're all probably used to using the app by now. Uh, it's the AXA Investment Managers live Q&A and I believe it's now open. So first to the lectern, please welcome Cesar. Thank you, Linda. Good morning, everyone, and thank you very much for, for being here. Uh, it's nice to see a full house. Um, let's, uh, I mean, they, they told me that they are being really serious about keeping track of time this year. I, only, I know that I only have 15 minutes. So let me um, uh, begin with the conclusion of, of, of what I'm here to tell you. Uh, the, ma the main message that I want to convey here today is that we at Sura believe that there is value uh, behind regional allocation within emerging markets. Um, if, if it may take some time uh, to understand the basics and the fundamentals behind the different regions that actually adapt to emerging markets, uh, global funds, but there is value behind it. We, we have found that there is um, an opportunity in terms of risk-adjusted returns and alpha generation if you look, if you delve deeper into emerging markets and not and just, um, <clears throat> excuse me, you don't go with a, with a market cap um, approach. So a couple of years ago, we are uh, basically at Sura, we're an emerging markets uh, asset manager. Uh, we have some global strategies for our retail clients, but we are basically and inherently an, an emerging markets asset manager. We're based in Latin America and we have presence across the region. So we started asking ourselves, um, why is it that we believe that there is an opportunity behind going regional within emerging markets? So the first thing that we uh, th wanted to check is that, is, is there a benefit to justify regional allocation within emerging markets? And if so, uh, is it possible to quantify? And then again, trying to uh, explain uh, the results that we were getting. So the first thing that we did was to go for a more traditional approach in terms of uh, asset allocation, using optimization models uh, to see if there was some value behind regional allocation. And then we decided to take it uh, one step further with uh, artificial intelligence and some uh, machine learning tools that we have been developing with our um, data scientists in the investment team. So if we begin by the main characteristics of uh, emerging market regions, uh, I mean, these two uh, charts speak for themselves. I mean, the, the difference between the different regions is quite obvious. So, by the way, PA stands for Pacific Alliance, which is uh, the region uh, that includes Colombia, Chile, Peru, and Mexico in Latin America. And the reason we have that as a different uh, bucket is because many, many global investors that we met frequently, uh, many of our clients, uh, tend to think that Latin America is just one big bucket and is just the same thing. And of course, what you get from the news, what hits the headlines is Argentina and Venezuela and, and, and of course Brazil and Mr. Bolsonaro lately. Uh, but the, the truth is that in terms of the market characteristics of these two regions, they're really, really different. So what, when we split uh, emerging markets into these four buckets, you will find that in terms of risk-adjusted returns and volatility, uh, they behave quite differently. And this is a, a sample of almost uh, two decades, and, and that um, is pretty clear. And then if you go with um, uh, uh, correlations, then again, you will find that if, if the, the entire emerging market spectrum behaves the same, then correlations should be higher. But 
In actuality, what you see is that that's not the case. Uh, if, when you look at China, India, emerging Europe, or the Pacific Alliance, the correlations are way below one, maybe with the exception of India and China. But um, again, it's not one. So there might be some uh, diversification benefits behind going regional. And if you double click on the Pacific Alliance, and this is just an example because it's the same for emerging Europe or even uh, Asia Pacific, then the, each country within the sub-regions, uh, the correlation is not one. So the, then again, there's a uh, diversification benefit. And it is very clear when you plot them in, a in an efficient frontier. So two very important things here to mention. The first one is that when you go with emerging markets, there seems to be uh, an opportunity against going uh, with the all-country world index, MSCI's index, uh, that's, that's the red one. Uh, so there's, for, with, without uh, increasing risk significantly, there seems to be a peak in terms of uh, expected returns. Because when you look at GEM, emerging, uh, emerging Asia, the Pacific Alliance, or even Brazil, for those uh, not uh, faint of heart, um, you will find that there is an opportunity there. Uh, to, to increase expected returns. So, and, and again, we are using a 20-year sample here. So, uh, and the second thing is that even within emerging markets, uh, they plot quite differently in this chart. I mean, emerging markets, uh, considering emerging Asia, Brazil, Pacific Alliance, and emerging Europe, when you average that, and you take the, the, the uh, weighted average, uh, then the, the result is the, is the green gem, but in fact, the, the risk return characteristics of each region are quite different, and they call for, for regional allocation. So then we decided, uh, so what do we do with this? So then we, wh what about, what if th the problem here is that we are taking 20 years, and only in those 20 years this holds? So we decided to split the entire data set in, the, in five different periods and run a black leader optimization approach for each period. So we took the information that we had, let's take for instance uh, the 2008-2019 period in the bottom right of the first chart. Uh, so we took the information available at the beginning of 2008 in terms of uh, returns, correlations, uh, and, and, and again, um, risk. And we optimized the portfolio using the different regions within emerging markets, and then let it run for the entire period. In this case, 11 years to 2008 to 2019. This is updated uh, to as of um, July this year. And the results in four of, out of five cases was that uh, there was some uh, enhancements in terms of risk-adjusted returns, as you can see in the in the in the chart on the right. So. It's not, a, it's not only because, uh, or not only the case in the entire um, time frame, but when you split it in different periods, it still holds. So we thought, what if we take this to the next level? We have been developing some machine learning tools over the last couple of years. They have proved to be very useful when uh, trying to predict economic variables. Um, but then we thought that it might be useful or interesting at least to use them in order to uh, uh, provide an asset allocation uh, uh, suggestion. So what we did is that we tested over 500 variables that might have an impact on performance uh, for the uh, um, global emerging markets and the single regions within emerging markets. And then we used the algorithms that we already had in place and also developed some additional ones and then created this optimal allocation process uh, that I will explain in more detail later and then test the results. One of the beauties of uh, artificial intelligence for machine learning is, is that they are inherently out of sample uh, because you train them for a period and then you, you just put them to work in a, in a period that, that is not uh, used for, for training. So basically what we did is that we used um, different uh, in, uh, tools like neural networks, adaptive boosting, support vector machines, random forests. Uh, but then we started thinking that there is a reason why artificial intelligence has not been that disruptive in, in, in finance, in capital markets. And that's because it's very hard um, to attribute results to different factors. Some of these models work as black boxes and, and, and the investment professionals find a hard time trying to understand uh, why the results are what they are. So we decided to uh, use 
to complement those uh, AI algorithms uh, with a more traditional approach. So we use uh, the more uh, traditional statistics uh, methods and also asset manager reports, research analysts, of course, including uh, our team uh, of, of bottom-up and top-down analysts at Suda, and also using market sentiment models to complement that. So what we did then was to create a meta uh, algorithm, uh, so to speak, um, to create a committee. So the, the, the way this works is that we ask the, the, this committee um, to look at, to, to rebalance the portfolio every three months. And by the sequential online learning, what we were trying to do is the, to make this committee to check the performance and the, and the actual accuracy of the different models that we were using to select every, every three months, to select the three most accurate uh, models for the current, for the, yeah, for the current uh, market conditions. And then just go with the allocation that these three models, the more accurate models given market conditions at, at, at every single point in time, suggested. And, and then uh, allocate the portfolio that way within emerging markets. So the first thing that we did was, okay, let's use this and train the algorithms from 2000, using information from 2000 to, to 2010, and then run the testing out of sample from 2010 to 2018, maintaining the weights that, um, Oh, that, that the uh, global emerging markets uh, benchmark had as of 2010. And the results that we got was that, uh, were that this, uh, that between 2010 and 2018, uh, our method, which is optimal with air quotes because it's not exactly an optimization process, as I just explained, uh, but the results show that there is value there uh, by just going with regional locations instead of following global emerging markets. So then we thought, what if um, this might be, mm, there, there might be an explanation for this, lying behind the fact that we've been experiencing a quite, a quite long rally in, in global equities over the last decade. So what if we tested the, most, the, the more um, difficult recent times, just taking 2017, 18, and, and year to date 2019, and that's what we did. So then again, we tried to, um, we, we trained the algorithms using information from January 2000 to July 2017 and just let it allocate our portfolio uh, in an efficient way for the last two years. And what we found was basically the same result. Again, um, if you um, try to distance from the traditional optimization tools that you might use for optimal asset allocation, uh, then you will find that, that it is also valuable to go regional within emerging markets, independent of the, of the method that you, that you use. So, why, I mean, the, the next question, the obvious set of questions, and this calls for further research, was why is this happening? Why is this so obvious that there is value behind go going regional within emerging markets? Well, one possible explanation is that some countries are very aligned to China uh, and uh, due to trade. So when you think about uh, the, the performance of uh, Brazil, for instance, it is quite linked uh, to, to whatever is happening in China as the main uh, uh, user of, of, of uh, raw materials produced in Brazil. Uh, but that, that not may be the, not be the case for other regions within emerging markets, such as emerging Europe and the Pacific Alliance with a, a, a stronger relationship with the US and not China. Um, the other thing is that even within regions, and as, as I said at the beginning, there's a difference. People tend to think that Brazil and the other countries within Latin America are the, basically the same thing. It's just the same bucket. Uh, but it turns out that it's not the case. And, and when we have really significant differences in terms of risk and return uh, profile. Um, also, uh, when you go with GEM, the Global Emerging Market Indices, you're not ben benefiting from the international advantage, uh, for the informational advantage of geographic um, uh, proximity. Uh, and that, that, there is extensive research uh, uh, that show that local managers have um, uh, some informational advantage because they are close to the companies that they are investing in. Um, we actually, last year when we came to this event, we showed some figures of, of, of some research that we, that we um, put together using Morningstar data. Um, 
we took the sharp ratio for one, two, three, and five years for the four different sub-regions within emerging markets that, that we have been talking about here, EMEA, Pacific Alliance, Brazil, and, and Asia Pacific. And what we found is that in 75% of the cases, local managers outperformed in terms of sharp ratio, uh, the, the global managers uh, uh, selecting in securities from London or New York. And further, we found that around 60% outperform in terms, not only in terms of sharp ratio, uh, but also in terms of total return in local currency. So there might be an explanation there that calls for further research, as I said. And the last one is that uh, there might be differences in market efficiency within emerging markets. Um, just to put some numbers uh, to this. So the, the average Standard & Poor's company uh, is uh, 53 billion of market cap, basically. And around 22 to 23 uh, analysts uh, covering that company. So that's a very efficient market. And you would expect to find completely different figures uh, for emerging markets. Uh, that's the case, uh, but it's uh, ever more uh, uh, difficult to find it in Asia Pacific. So when you go to Brazil, uh, the average size of the Brazilian company is 7 billion and is followed by uh, nine analysts. When you go to the Pacific Alliance, the average size is 4 billion, so we're basically a mid-market uh, uh, mid, uh, cap uh, market. And, it, and on average, eight analysts follow uh, the, like the average company within the, in the Pacific Alliance. But when you go, when you go to Asia, um, it, it used to have the same numbers, or roughly the same numbers as Latin America. But today, using Morningstar's latest data as of July uh, 2019, the average Asia-Pacific company uh, is uh, 20 billion in market cap and is followed by 19 analysts. So it, I'm not saying that Asia Pacific has become a, uh, a developed market or an efficient market. Of course, you, you, you still have all the, all the risks embedded in, in, in developing economies. But the fact is that it's getting more popular and more crowded as a trade, as, even as a long-term trade by global asset allocators such as the superannuation industry. So what you're getting is that it is becoming more efficient, more people looking at uh, securities in Asia Pacific and therefore the, market are become, the markets there are becoming a bit more efficient and it's harder to find alpha. So uh, that's one possible explanation, one additional explanation to why uh, when you go regional within emerging markets uh, you get uh, uh, to enhance uh, your risk adjusted returns uh, and, and then of course uh, get some additional alpha. Thank you very much. Come to the stage now, please. Thank you for that, Cesar. Thank you, Linda. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, really, what I wanted to talk about was really to follow up on what Cesar had been talking about and all of this research from doing it and look at it from sort of kind of the behind the, the why aspect rather than the markets themselves and the technology. It was one of the things that uh, we started the relationship with Sura over four years ago. In fact, the fund, Australian Domicile Fund had his birthday yesterday, or for the four-year birthday for it. And when we started looking at the performance, as it was starting to roll out and we were starting to generate the track record, because it had not been done in an AUD domiciled fund to have exposure to Pacific Alliance equities. It's not something that actually existed at all at that point in time out here. And we knew as part of what we we're going to do was an educated process. This is different, right? You look at people and you say, I want to invest in emerging markets and I want to do it regionally. Four years ago, practically everybody in this room looked at me and said, are you mad? You know, why? We're not going to do that. And so we were looking at the why, what, what impact, and that's part of what the, uh, the research was actually done because we were starting to see it coming out in the numbers. And if you look at... One of the things that always drove us when we looked at and we looked at why it actually came to is there is an underlying fundamental difference for it. We all have, Cesar actually touched on it, we all look at Latin America and we see the Latin American index if we're actually looking at index to check how a portfolio might be going and we see a volatile index. That is actually what we look at when we see it. But in fact, if you actually strip Brazil out, you see an entirely different index altogether. And the Latin American index is made up of five countries. It's the four Pacific Alliance, which is Mexico, Colombia, Chile, and Peru, and Brazil. And depending on exactly which economy is doing what, 
they're sort of kind of 50-50 between Brazil and Pacific Alliance. Brazil is highly volatile, Pacific Alliance is much less so. Now, if we look at this actually drives a big part of what you see in your portfolios and what drives the market looks. We're part of Asia. Australia is a part of Asia. We look up to Asia, we see Asia, we trade with Asia, we know Asia. We go there, we go on holidays there, we work there. And Asia has always been a very large part of our investable market, both in developed markets and particularly in emerging markets. And as China has actually increased its impact to it, it has just kept growing as far as the impact. So when you look at that, that slide's really telling us that in effect, three quarters of the emerging market index is China and Asia, China related. I'm not telling you anything that you don't know from doing that. And hence, why what we tend to do is we tend to have, assuming that we're looking at emerging market as a discrete asset in and of itself, we tend to look at and go, okay, I will have a diversified approach by having a gem style, be it one, multiple managers, etc., and then I will actually take my tilt and actually put it towards Asia. We know it, and let's face it, over the last 10 odd years, this has been a very good bet for actually doing it. There is, and there are continue to be good reasons. I'm not here, Cesar's not here to actually say, Asia's not good, Asia's bad, you should change your money and move away from it. Absolutely not. We're saying something very different. What we have ended up with in the market over here is typically a lot of people have an overexposure to Asia because gem managers, if, unless they're pure index, quite often have an Asian bias. And then you have an Asian manager set selection on top of it. And so a lot of people, emerging market exposure is 80, 85, 90% actually biased towards emerging Asia in some shape, form or description. That brings with it a risk characteristic. And that is in part what we're actually talking about is the performance of Pacific Alliance as a region. There is, a, there is actually a good performance benefit for doing it, but it's predominantly not the reason why we actually suggest that you select it in there. We actually suggest you look at it as a risk reduction, it's a mitigation. When you look at the global emerging market as a whole, we've got that 75% is Asia and China. We've got the other parts of the world that predominantly most of us are not actually interested in investing in as a discrete asset. That's Africa, Northern Africa, and emerging Europe. And then you've got the Latin America as the single largest chunk of it, and we have seen it through the eyes of Brazil. 10 years ago, we used to be into BRICS. It was Brazil, Russia, etc. We still see Pacific Alliance through that. So that actually drives, when we actually look at it and you want to actually change the portfolio and you want to change the risk ratio of it, you need to put something with your China and Asia. And what we know from doing the numbers that have come up through the presentation is what actually does reduce the risk for it is going for Pacific Alliance. The other area I wanted to touch on, because this actually does affect Pacific Alliance and it actually is one of the things that drives part of the, the differential in uh, the volatility that we saw in effect that comes out of the risk return that Cesar was talking about. Most people don't tend to look at it this way. This is the USA's major trading partners. When we read the newspaper, we hear about it, it's USA and it's China on trade and that's it. In actual fact, Mexico, Canada and China are pretty much equal sized as far as trading partners go. But there is a very huge imbalance with China and the US. And that's what's actually driving the underlying of it. But for the US, you've actually got pretty much equal trading partners for it. Another one that actually drives the process as well, Trans-Pacific Partnership, or the TPP minus USA, and it's got 84 names depending on which country you're actually in. But basically, when you actually take that out, and that is now in effect, and it has made a difference in Australia's trading patterns when you actually look at the trade that's now actually conducted with Chile, et cetera, and, and Mexico, actually having this in place has increased the trade that's moved there. So there is a balancing fact, and that then comes down to the currency side of it as well. So these underlying aspects actually do affect what you then see in your risk-adjusted return, because it's AUD denominated when we bring it out to with Caesar's number, they're not USD, they're AUD for doing it. And that drives underlying what you see in portfolio and return. And the final point that I wanted to touch on this was ESG. It's a big issue and it's going to get bigger. 
One of the issues with ESG is emerging markets. We all know it, there's a problem. Uh, looking at the governance side in emerging markets, there are issues. To start with, how do you even define the governance part in the ESG component when the market is predominantly state-owned? It's actually very difficult to start that process for doing it. So one of the things that, again, and it comes back to the volatility side of it, in these Pacific Alliance countries, very, very, very few of the companies are actually state-owned or even have a, a majority of state ownership in them. So that actually allows you to actually get the governance in. Inside Sura's investment process, they actually have 20% of the total investment process actually goes to ESG and governance standards. Quantifying the end result is hard, but they know, and we've seen it, that it actually adds a value into the process. It is a risk reducer inside them. And the very final point that I actually wanted to touch on that goes into the environmental side of it is increasingly we're going to actually see a premium on longer trade routes. It takes energy to move stuff from one side of the world to the other. When you actually look at the United States, which dominates the world, yes, and uh, we heard in the plenary this morning from Anne that, you know, in fact, the vast majority of the US economy is internal, but still there's a very large part is external. The trade routes from Mexico versus the trade routes from China are much shorter. At this point in time, that has very little impact. But I suspect over the long term, we will actually see that having an increasing impact in how we actually consider what we do for portfolios. So on that note, thank you very much. I'm going to hand over to Greg and uh, appreciate your time. Thank you. Thanks, Richard. Thanks, Linda. Thanks to Zah. Uh, thankfully, I've got no slides up here, so unfortunately, you all need to look at me. Good luck with that. I want to give you a bit of an experience of the lived experience that we at Host Plus have had of investing in emerging markets, right? And especially regional allocations. So I just want to try and tie together some of the things that Cesar and Richard had mentioned earlier on. Because where you looked at Cesar's slide and it said there's a 2000 to 2010 kind of training period and then there's a 2010 plus testing period, we did that testing ourselves with real money in a variety of different markets. And there are some key learnings that I want to bring to the table regarding that 10 year lived experience. And the key insight is about implementation. Well, you can have very clever ideas and, well, we thought they were clever at the time. You can have very clever ideas regarding where you might want to allocate, but it's how you allocate that becomes a real challenge. So, but why would you do it in the first place? I mean, as you'd be aware, we're a young fund, young member demographic, which we believe makes us able to be a long-term investor. And if you're going to be a long-term investor, you want to invest in growth assets. And if you want to invest in growth type assets, you want to find emerging markets. You want to find places in the world where you've got an upcoming middle class, where you've got growth in the consumer. All of the standard tropes that you've heard about this part of the market, they're all the things we believe in and still believe in. And especially in a world where we're now looking at growth as being a very difficult thing to identify and if, especially to invest in. We're in a low growth world now. Emerging markets do have the potential for strong growth. So does venture capital as well, but I'll leave that to Sam to talk about at another time. But for us, so how did we go about it? 15 years ago, we identified that we really needed to build our allocation to emerging markets. At that stage, if you had a look at the allocation we had, it was through our emerging market discretionary allocations from our developed market managers and comprised around about 1% of our total fund. 1% allocated to a part of the world that we could see in 10, 15 years' time would potentially be the largest contributor to GDP globally. That, that to me, if you're looking at the title of this, have we got our exposure right? We did not have it right in 2005. So what did we do about it? Well, well, firstly, I should say, so we were one of those mad funds that Richard has alluded to that actually believed that you could make a regional allocation back then, but I'll get to that. But at that stage, 1% allocation, immediately what we looked at then was, even that allocation was discretionary. It's the managers 
developed market managers who could allocate to emerging markets. And therefore, we could have had a zero allocation. So the first thing we did was change that allocation to several of our managers to have a dedicated emerging market exposure. And we moved our allocation from a massive one all the way to two. But 2006 and onwards, and we decided that we needed to do a lot better than that. How would we do a lot better than that? Because at that stage, you've got to understand we looked at China as a part of the world that, for all the reasons that Richard alluded to before, China, proximity, growth of the middle class, all of these attributes, and the fact that for us, we're a part of Asia, made great sense to find a way into that market, but how do you do that? I mean, at the moment, what we did through that mandate, and we added several more later on, was mainly through just eight shares. You're investing in those state-owned enterprises that effectively are not leveraged to the attributes that we wanted in that part of the world. So what do we do about that? We tried to look at property, and there are some people in the room here who helped us with that property allocation. I'm looking at you, Ken. Trying to build our way into a part of the world where we thought, how do we leverage ourselves to that consumer? And one way was retail property through China and Asia. And we did get some little footholds in Singapore, but we couldn't crack the nut, which was China at that stage. So we had to think a little differently. How did we think? We stopped thinking for a while because the GFC hit and pretty much for four years everything was on hold. Right, so come 2010, where the world has largely recovered, we're like, what are we going to do now? How can we get back into this Asian region? We want to leverage ourselves to that growth again. So what did we do? We took that 10% allocation we had of emerging markets within developed, took it to 20. So we took our total allocation from two to four with a view to go to six all made perfect sense to us, but how do you do that six? That allocation we did to emerging markets back then, instead of the 79% to Asia, was around about 50% to Asia. And we thought disproportionately there should be a higher allocation. So for the first time, we thought, how do we work out globally to have a regional allocation to a particular part of the market? How do you do that? Especially since, as I said before, the problem we had was not only that we could only get access through eight shares and the like, right, which was a real challenge to us, we were missing out huge parts of the market. So what we tried to do was look at a series of options. We tried to investigate getting a QFI licence, but decided that was too challenging. Right, we couldn't quite make that work. We looked, with the help of JANA, at creating a series of Asian region-specific mandates, which we ended up doing, appointing three managers in that space in 2012. Right, so we took that allocation of 50% in Asia to close to 75% to Asia. Significant regional tilt on the basis of our understanding of that part of the market. We also decided that even then, given that eight share exposure, that wasn't enough. We had to do better. How do you get the consumer? We had to go through the private equity part of the market as well. And so we went to Sigula Guff at that stage, who had a brick fund, and we said we didn't want the B, the R, and the I, we just wanted the C. So we created a Chinese-only private equity mandate to try and leverage that consumer part, the Alibaba's 10 cents Baidu's in their really formative stage, and that's been an incredibly successful way to go about it. But, and the last one was we tried property again and tried to find the right partner, but in effect we turned out to be like Muriel. We kept looking for a partner, but we were unable to find one at any stage. So where do we end up with all of this? Asian equity incubator, the challenge then is implementation. What are you going to do? Go and buy beta in that part of the world with all of its individual proclivities and difficulties per particular jurisdiction? We couldn't do that. We thought we had to go through an active management path. And if we're going to do active management, the last thing you want is to try and access a beta and blow it all up with a manager who fails to even get that beta. So we needed a multiplicity of managers. We chose three. And we effectively stuck with that till we have for the last seven years. We've got some key learnings from that, which I'll just come to, but it gets back to what Richard was saying. We chose those three managers on the basis of their regional knowledge. There was one manager in Hong Kong, one manager in Singapore, and one manager in Perth. Very, diff very far away from Melbourne and Sydney, at least. Today, where are we? We're at an 8% allocation to emerging markets, which is substantially more than most of our peers. Have we got the allocation right? We're unsure. We just still think that's an underrepresentation of where we should be. But still, 8% is a journey, and it's been a tremendous journey the past year or so. 
last 10 years, in fact, as emerging markets have particularly underperformed. So where are the learnings? The tilt made good sense, but it's the implementation that was really hard. Two of those managers have since gone. One of them had the temerity to invest with an oligarch, and as Rufus explained to us the other day, oligarchs get taken down by governments sometimes. This happened in the Philippines. So that manager's business risk, gone. So we had to learn from that. It's that you may have an idea, the implementation is a challenge. We've got one good manager there still. And the world has changed. Shanghai Connect came through in 2014. You can now access mainland China, the A shares. You can also then look at the Asian tilt. It's now in the benchmark, it's built in. Those A shares are now in the MSCI benchmark. Do we need to have a tilt to Asia anymore considering it's now mainstream? And lastly, the bit I would say that is the key learning for us as well is you can't just do it via the, the listed markets. There really needs to be, the listed markets give you a representation of a particular emerging market jurisdiction, but we still think property, infrastructure, and especially private equity are other ways to try and access that part of the market. Have we got it all right? Obviously not. We're still on a journey and we need to look at other parts of the world like Pacific Alliance, India, that bias to Asia was a great thing to have for maybe 10 years, but what's next? Anyway, thank you very much. So we'll now open up for questions. There is a mic if you'd like to ask a question from the floor. And we've got some questions coming through the Q&A. Um, one of the questions is regarding currency. Um, should you maintain your local currency or hedge back to base currencies? Oh, yeah, all right, I'll answer that. <laughs> we've chosen to maintain the local currency. I mean, there's a, the challenge with that is that there are substantial costs associated with actually hedging out those currencies, which, especially in a, you know, the higher interest rates you're getting from those parts of the world. But the other part is the fact that we think those currencies will appreciate over time. Right? So you really do want that exposure to that part of the world. And it's a long-term view, and it hasn't necessarily paid off over the short term while the US has been ascendant, but we still think as a very long-term view, it is sensible to have exposure to the local currencies. How about the rest of the panel, any? Yeah, well, uh, that's a very good question. It, de it depends on um, your current national allocation and, and, and the way you uh, treat your currency exposure in your uh, overall portfolio. Uh, what we do in our regional uh, in, in mandates and, 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 um, and funds is that we, we uh, don't hedge. Uh, again, basically because of the same reasons that Greg was mentioning. Uh, and we. Uh, our strategies are long-term focused, so we think that in the longer term, um, currency becomes less of an issue in terms of uh, long-term performance. So we just don't, don't hedge. And the other point that Greg, Greg was mentioning is that maybe not the case in the in the that's not the case in Mexico. Mm -hmm. Mexico is actually uh, the MXN is the, the the most liquid currency in the emerging world. Uh, but when you go to Peru or or Chile, it's more difficult to actually. Um, uh, put some hedging strategies in place because it's uh, costly. So it, it just doesn't make sense, both because of the fundamental belief that in the longer term, in an equities, well-diversified portfolio, um, the, the currency factor fades away, um, but, but also because it's really costly in the shorter term and it will cost you in terms of uh, performance. And I'd just I'd, I'd add to that that what we do see quite a lot of as well is people actually look at it whilst the currency is unhedged because your liabilities are in Australian dollars, so ultimately you're looking at what your value is for doing it. It's not uncommon for us to get asked the question as well as, but what does this look like in USD? Because you might well be replacing someone that's actually USD denominated, and that actually changes quite significantly what the risk profile, when you're trying to compare the two apples in the box to look at it, you go, well, okay, what is it in USD? But ultimately not with hedged over the top. Thank you. We have a question over here. Thank you. Uh, one for the panel. It's Raymond Williams from Parametric. Just wondered if any of you could offer some comments around uh, the wisdom of a fund getting um, some core EM exposure by extending uh, an MSCI World developed market um, mandate to all countries versus going to a specific EM specialist manager. I, uh, one of the things I'd actually just say over the top, I mean, 
obviously coming from a very biased point of view, but uh, we do know, and Cesar actually touched on some of the research and we presented it last year, is there are significant local benefits mm -hmm. in certain markets, not in all markets, but in certain markets. Um, uh, uh, the example that I actually always use, and uh, Felipe Sanjo, who's the head of equities for Sura and the portfolio manager, he talks about in Chile, um, a fortnight before companies actually give out their uh, performance uh, reports for the year, they're actually available for any investors to go and have a look at. Yeah. And Sura turns up across all of its different divisions and looks through, I mean, this is a 140 billion US dollar manager over in the region, and they turn up across multiple divisions and go and have a look at them. And I don't think you've ever seen any foreign manager turn up at these no, briefings. Never. And these are the things that drives a huge level of knowledge difference. And so it's, it's, it's boots on the ground quite often. It's, you know, we select for skill, for, for doing bits and pieces in many things that we do in the world. So that's just, that's the way that I actually see it from yeah. that. I think that, of course, you have to take into consideration the fact that uh, you may have some, uh, I mean, it requires time. And, and, uh, and, and probably the skills to find the right manager to do the job in each region. Um, and also there might be some um, capacity constraints depending on the size of the different markets that we're talking about here. Uh, but, it, but we believe that it definitely pays off. Uh, what, what Richard was mentioning is something that is really valuable and it's really difficult for a, I don't know, a, a very talented portfolio manager sitting in London or, or in Wall Street to actually go to the uh, headquarters of the companies as we do and uh, look at the minutes of the, of the, of the board meetings uh, and the plans uh, beforehand. That's something that uh, it's, uh, I mean, it's a common practice. It's absolutely legal, <laughs> by the way. Uh, and you have access to it. And it's just uh, for, for a foreign manager, it would be very costly to do something like that. And we are able to do that because we're there. And, I, and I, I'm pretty sure it's the same case for Asian-based asset managers or uh, Eastern Europe-based asset managers. And I, I suppose we've got, we do both, Raywan. In, in effect, yeah. the, if you're taking the expansion of the index out to be the world, you're effectively enabling your managers, you're, you're directing your managers to some degree to say that you need an allocation to their benchmark exposure. But that's still in a discretionary sense in that mandate. So we also want to make sure that we've got managers who hopefully are domiciled in particular regions who have specific EM mandates so it's no longer discretionary. We get an allocation that's guaranteed. I keep talking so Ken doesn't talk. <laughs> Question here. Uh, he's going to talk now. <laughs> Greg, I've got a question for you <laughs> and for the whole panel. Um, you mentioned uh, we've talked about equities and then you said private equity, property and uh, infrastructure, but you didn't mention debt. Yeah. And I wondered where, where that fits into the whole panoply. I, I hazard to say that's a good question, Ken. <laughs> <laughs> Um, look, it's one of the things that we've looked at from our funds perspective, and I agree it looks very attractive at this stage. The trouble is we have such a substantial equity exposure in that part of the world anyway. So our play has been more in the growth part of the world, but if I look at the way the rest of the world is at the emerging market debt space and I look at what might happen to their cash rates and where they are at the moment, you can just see that there's a long-term benefit there, but we think we can ride that better in the emerging market equity space than in the debt space. But still, we're looking at it continually. Yeah, and um, that's uh, just building up on, on, on what Greg mentioned. Um, we, we do have some regional strategies in, in uh, corporates, uh, international uh, regulation corporates, on, uh, uh, for uh, like um, Regas and 144A uh, in the US, and there's a substantial amount, that th there's a market for that. Um, the thing for, a, and I think he's completely right about that, the thing for a global uh, manager is that most of the, of the bonds that we have in our markets are uh, triple Bs. Maybe some uh, Mexican or, or Chilean companies are single As, so in this, uh, context where we are now, when we're heading towards probably a global um, recession, um, going for triple B bonds might be like doubling down on your equity exposure. Uh, so for for us, it makes a lot of sense, but for a global allocator, it might be a bit uh, riskier. Uh, going to private debt, that's something that we have also identified in our markets, and also uh, actually our local clients are asking for that 
because of the yields that we are getting. I mean, of course, we're not at, at, at the same point of, of, of uh, Western Europe with the negative uh, nominal rates or things like that. But uh, we have been experiencing low uh, interest rates also in some of our markets. So many clients are asking for, for yield pickup. And so we have been exploring some private debt uh, opportunities, and that's something that is actually picking up in, in, in the region, across all countries, especially in, in, in Mexico and Chile. Uh, there, that's, uh, that's, uh, it, it has had some interest uh, on, on those opportunities, yeah. There's a question, uh, there, I think. Uh, a question over there. Oh, hi, uh, Whitney Drayton, Artisan Partners. Cesar, you mentioned uh, ESG screens, and uh, just wondering in the developing world yep. if an ESG screen is the same as the developed world. Um, there are many flawed yep. companies, labor practices, environmental issues coming yep. out of that region, and uh, a cynic would say if something looks perfect in the developing world, go the other way because there's all, it's so cyclical yep. and, and, and messy in that regard. And I'm just curious. If, if you use a different lens. Yeah, I mean, it, if, if I had to mention one uh, uh, challenging part of our, work, of our everyday job following companies, both in the equity and fixed income spectrum, is uh, coming across all the uh, ESG information and, and, and behavior of the companies. That's, that's certainly challenging. Um, and that's one of the reasons why we think that uh, it is very important to have a local player actually doing that for you when you're a global allocator, far from the uh, headquarters of the companies that you're investing in. Um, one, the, the first big issue is that um, companies are starting to learn this is important uh, as the investor base of foreign investors is increasing as a percentage of total uh, uh, market cap, they have learned that this is important because they are demanding it. Uh, we ever more, uh, we, with ever more uh, European um, investors and Australian investors, some at least, uh, they're starting to, to get these questions. And the, the uh, investor relations teams uh, are getting used to getting these types of questions. And they are taking this really seriously. And there's, I, I would say that there is a, a, a regional effort. The, the, the actual ex the exchanges and local regulators are trying to uh, uh, incentivize all the companies to actually increase the, and improve the quality of the information they provide. But the first uh, I would say that the first obstacle is, is information. Not all companies are aware of the importance of that. Uh, I would say that probably 90% of the companies understand the importance, but there's this 10% where they, you will get uh, the plain answer that um, I don't measure that. <laughs> I really don't care. I don't have any metrics for, 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 to give you. Uh, so we have uh, the, the answer to, to, to that problem is that we have developed this ranking, this internal ranking. Um, and, and of course, when you don't get the information, you need to punish those companies and actually you, you either increase the discount rate or just uh, um, complement the, the risk return profile of each single investment opportunity uh, to actually give, shed some light on, on the, for, the, for the portfolio managers and uh, for them to t make the decision. Um, I would say that uh, the, the other thing is that it is very important and it has been very helpful uh, for us to have uh, external help. Uh, so we teamed up with uh, external providers of ESG. Um, of course, the coverage in Latin America is not as good as it is in uh, other parts of the world. Uh, but uh, it is, uh, in, I, mean, I mean, it is increasing uh, as a, uh, the, the importance of this as a factor. Uh, so uh, you, can, you get every year, uh, MCI and Fitch and Standard & Poor's, they're bringing new names uh, to the investable universe that they cover in terms of ESG, and that's also very helpful. Thank you. Uh, one quick question. Uh, Greg, on your quest in Asia, have you been focusing on the domestic companies that are either through listed equities or private equities that is focusing on the domestic consumer or the EM domestic exporter and uh, also interested to understand is there a different lens you're using with the G part of ESG in a command economy like China? Uh, I suppose when it comes to it, we, we wanted leverage into pretty much both of those attributes to the extent that we could. China is a, a net exporter but also that growth of the middle class that I'd alluded to before. So. But it, it, it's difficult, I suppose, to, 
to be that incisive with regard to investments when you're investing through a fund to fund or through listed equity markets to a separate manager. So to the extent that we had those trends within the portfolio, it's not as if we could bias one way or the other. So we were just reliant upon a more general approach to those without being highly specific. The G part of it in a command economy is, it, exactly, it is a command economy. Right? We need to accept the fact that it's going to be a huge part of the world now. It is now, it will be in the future. And that the challenges that come from investing in China are related to how it evolves. And But we have similar challenges all over the world. We had this discussion at the board many years ago. And it was, yes, there are issues with regard to China, but they don't change by us not being there. They change by us being there and hopefully guiding practices to be different to what they are today. To the extent that you can, it's still a command economy, right? And at some stage, we may choose differently. But yeah, it's a very challenging part of the world, but every part of the world is challenging. The US is challenging at the moment with regard to governance, how it's being governed. So I don't think we have the answers, but we're certainly aware that it's a big question. So thank you. Unfortunately, we have to wind up the questions now. Um, just want to thank our speakers, Cesar, Richard and Greg, for a really interesting session. Mm -hmm.